Thank you, brother. And I thank you for the songs this morning. Um, thank you for opening up with a mighty fortress as our God. Do that every Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. I do love it, though. I love it so good. Hope you've got your copy of God's Word. You're there in Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to look at those first three verses. And let me remind you, I'm not going to go through the Ten Commandments. We did that on Wednesday nights. And if you want those, you can get on our app. You can go to the YouTube, uh, our YouTube, whatever it is on YouTube. You can go there, and uh, you can get all of those. We all took part of that. Barry taught some of that. Uh, Chuck taught some of that. Um, I taught one of them. Um, so we, pa- I think Patrick taught one or two. So you can go there and pick those up. I'm not going to deal with each one of the commandments because we've done that. Uh, now in a study on Wednesday nights. Uh, last week I opened up and I shared with you a story from, it really was about the, the, that unusual sermon uh, in the presence of God by Dr. Raymond Edmund, who in the midst of his sermon fell dead there, the president at uh, Wheaton College. Well, I want to come back and I want to give you a statement from uh, the current president at Wheaton College. Uh, Dr. Philip Graham Riken, who is 88 years old, and he is still president at Wheaton. I want you to listen. He says he was reading an article, uh, a piece of research that had come out of Princeton's religion department. It's a piece of religious research uh, that they were working on. He said the title of it was this, Religion is Gaining Ground, but Morality is Losing Ground. Now listen to what Dr. Riken said in his commentary on Exodus. He said, how can people be more interested in God and at the same time less willing to do what he says? The only explanation is that people do not know the God of the Bible. Because if they did, they would recognize the absolute authority of his law. Respect for God always demands respect for his law. And wherever people have a low regard for God's law, as they do in our culture, it is ultimately because they have a low regard for God. That's a powerful statement when you just sit and think about it. You begin to ask yourself the question, how serious am I about God? Well, how serious am I about the Word of God? Uh, That's exactly what we're going to look at is how serious are we about what God says to us? We live in a day and time where everybody wants some kind of thrilling spiritual experience. They want an emotional experience, a feeling. They want something to happen to them that they can talk about, that they can walk away from that and say, I've had this religious experience. But they never want the daily walk with Jesus Christ, nor do they really want the commitment to the Word of God. They want a religious experience. We want the cold chills. We want the goosebumps. We want the assurance of feeling like, you know, we've been saved and we're okay, but we really do not want the lifestyle of a Christian. Well, it's interesting that the Hebrews got to experience um, the power of God and the presence of God. Now, we've been looking at this for a few weeks, and the interesting thing to me is how God now has revealed his presence to them in chapter 19. He's revealed two aspects of his presence, that of the love and that of holiness, the tenderness of God and the holiness of God. But now when you come to chapter 20, They are going to not experience, but they're going to encounter the Word of God. They've experienced the power of God. Remember back all of the plagues in Egypt, the power of God at the Red Sea, the power of God at uh, Meribah, where uh, where they could not drink the water, and then God gave them fresh water to drink. They've experienced the power of God. Now they've experienced the presence of God in chapter 19, but now they're going to come and they're going to be, there's going to be this encounter with the Word of God. And let me just say something, uh, just as we're getting into this, I have, um, through, 
Through these last uh, number of months, I have been drawn into the study in Exodus in two areas that I have uh, found that the Scripture speaking to me. The two areas happen to be the wisdom of God and the worship of God. Uh, so in these two areas, it's just feeding my soul personally, uh, and it's feeding it in the area of the wisdom of God and the worship of God, which leads me next Sunday's Mother's Day. By the way, now I told you. So you, you don't forget it. You know, it's Mother's Day next Sunday. And next Sunday, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna move to the New Testament. I'm gonna move out of Exodus and I'm gonna move to, to a portion of scripture that's going to deal with this whole issue of ultimately the worship of Jesus Christ. But that's where we are this morning, back in Exodus. And then the Sunday after that is graduation Sunday. And I think I'm going to come back to the 20th chapter that Sunday, but I don't know. Anyway, there you go. So let's move to the text now. You come to this chapter, chapter 20, and you're coming to these 10 commandments, though we're not going to look at these um, per se, verse by verse. Uh, you're coming to really what deals with relationship. If you want to sum up, by the way, 10 is the number of responsibility in Hebrew, you know, each of these numbers, you've got something that's attached to them. Well, responsibility is attached to the number 10. Uh, and there is a responsibility here on our part to keep the Word of God. But these are divided up into two parts. You can take the first four commandments, and they deal with our responsibility in our relationship with God. Then you have the next six commandments, and they deal with our responsibility in how we relate to one another. So the first four, my responsibility to God. The, the, the next six, my responsibility to other people, to you, uh, uh, to each other. But now God's going to speak in this 20th chapter. He's been speaking to Moses in chapter 19. You remember he'd call Moses up. Moses would go up and he'd come back down. He'd talk to the people. Well, now God is going to speak to the people. And he's going to speak to them out of this thunder, out of this blaring of this trumpet, out of the cloud, out of the smoke, out of the fire, out of the quaking of the mountain. Out of all of that, the word, the word of God is going to come. They'll hear God's voice in the midst of all of this other stuff that is going on. So when you come to the word of God, they're going to encounter the word of God when you come to the Word of God, you're going to see that God's Word reveals God's heart. Everything that God is going to give now in chapter 20 is going to be His heart. What is God's heart like? Can I know God's heart? Well, He's going to give you a good insight into His heart when you start reading these commandments, even when you, even in this prologue before you even get into the giving of the law. So I'm just going to deal with the first three verses this morning, and I want you to see this, that, uh, that the heart of God can be seen as very personal. Now, let me begin in verse 1 of chapter 20. Then God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. Now, let me just stop with that, because that's a tremendous statement there that we read so often, and, and uh, we're so familiar with, and that's the real danger. I, I say this a lot. It's a real danger to become so familiar with the Word of God that you just run through it. And you never stop to really think about what is God saying in this statement because you read this statement countless times in the Old Testament. Uh, I am the Lord your God. He has said that over and over already, and he's going to say it over and over through the rest of the Old Testament. But it is something specific here. Just look at it for a moment. Let me show you. Let me show you the grammar and how important the grammar is and what is actually being said in this. When you see that expression, Lord, your God, do you see the personal pronoun there, your? That's the second person singular. It's the second person singular. It's not the third person plural. And you say, well, now, why is that important? Because this, God's not speaking to the whole congregation there. God's not speaking to all of Israel that is gathered there at Mount Sinai. 
He's not talking to the whole assembly of Israel. The second person singular is this. It's as if God has come down off that mountain and he's walked over and he's come to Rich and he says, I am the Lord, your God. Do you see how personal that is? And we read that over and over and over and we just let it just slip by and you miss the personal nature of what God is saying because he is coming to every single one of us and he is saying, I am your God. It is a personal word to every single Jew. And I happen to believe that there were two, two and a half million Jews that were there. God was speaking to each one of them. Now, they would catch that in the Hebrew. They would understand that's what he was saying. Just as I tried dramatically to show it to you, because it is dramatic. No other God does that. You can't find that. I've read the Quran. You can't find that in the Quran where Allah comes and says, I am your God personally. In fact, if you ask an imam that, he would tell you that is an offense to God. That's blasphemy. Don't talk about Allah in that way. Buddha didn't do that. Buddha didn't want to be bothered with anybody, by the way. Uh, you, you know, Zoroastrianism, uh, Zoroaster never was personal like that. Any of the gods of the Hindus, no god in all of history that has been worshipped by man was, an, was a personal god like our god. I am the Lord, your god, he is saying. It is a personal word to every single one of us. And what he's saying in that is this, I care for you. I care for you and I know you. I read a study out of um, University of Southern California in San Diego. Scientists there did an int a fascinating study. And I want you to listen to this because it's absolutely unbelievable. They would take a Q-tip swab and they would swab telephones, and they did, they did a study on it. Now listen to what they found. This is amazing. The process can reveal the types of soaps, lotions, shampoo, makeup, such as food such as vegetarian or meat eaters, or if you like spicy foods, or the type of drinks you drink, medications, even the material of clothing one uses. Dr. Pieter Dorstein, professor of pharma pharmaceutical science at the university said, we could tell if a person is likely female, uses high-end cosmetic, dyes her hair, drinks coffee, prefers wine over beer, well, y'all forget that, like spicy food, is treated for depression. Some of the swabs were able to trace molecular deposits over a month old, leading, listen, leading the researchers to project high potential for use in a variety of settings, including, including criminal investigation. And you say, when I have this, what use is all of that? What, what if the next time you show up at the airport, they say, we're going to swab your telephone? Because by swabbing your telephone, we can tell if you've touched anything like fertilizer, nitroglycerin, or gunpowder within the last three months. Pretty wild, isn't it? Yes, pastor, yes, yes, yes. Pretty, pretty wild. With our approach, said Dorstein, one can create a profile of the life and lifestyle of the person. Now, let me tell you something. When God comes and he says, I am the Lord your God, he knows you better than that. He doesn't need to check out your molecular structure or your DNA. He put it all together. And even though he put it together and he knows us, he comes to us and he still says to us, I'm your God. Now that's just good. I'm thankful for that. I am thankful for this phrase, and I want every time that you read this for you to think about the fact that when God says, I am the Lord your God, he is speaking directly to you. Now, you can go home on that, but we're not going to. Uh, but that's a word where we can just go home on. So the heart of God revealed, he's personal. 
When he comes, and what he's doing here is he is giving us the introduction to the law. We're getting the introduction to the law here. It's going to come in verse 3. This is just verse 2, and we're halfway through it. So let me give you the second thing that is here. When you, when you come to his word, his word reveals his grace. Now, I'm just amazed at this. I've never seen it before, uh, but I'm seeing it this time as I go through Exodus, is the grace of God that is here. It is just all over this place. God comes, and listen, you're going to hear this over and over again as well. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery? God is going to say that a multitude of times through the Old Testament. That's how he's identified. That's how he is known. He is known as the one who came and redeemed them, delivered them, saved them, and brought them out of Egypt and out of slavery. Now, how did God do that? Now, that's the question. Because every time that statement is used, he is referring to one major event, and that's the Passover. That's what they're to remember. Once a year, every single year, without fail, they are to remember the fact that they took a lamb, they slayed a lamb, they took that blood, they painted it over the door, down the doorpost, over the door on the lintel, and that night the destroyer came through, and as the destroyer came through Egypt, every house that had the blood on it, he passed over that house. Here's a perfect picture of what the Messiah is going to do. It's a perfect picture of what Jesus Christ is going to do for every single one of us who have trusted in him as Lord and Savior, that we've been washed in his blood so that at the very moment of death, as Satan reaches out to grab us, we are safe in the arms of Jesus. Why? Because of the blood. Because of Calvary because of the empty tomb, because of what Jesus did, because of what he did, not what we did. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For you've been saved by faith, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. So God saved them. He redeemed them. He brought them out. And he brought them out of that house of slavery, and he set them free to do his will. Now, folks, when you come to this and you come to these Ten Commandments, let me tell you something. You're not just coming to a word that's passe. A lot of people today like to think, well, you know, that's, that's all at another time. And, uh, you know, people even make fun of the Ten Commandments anymore. Uh, we've taken them down. The government has made a priority of removing the Ten Commandments from courthouses and everywhere else. Schools have taken them down. Hey, aren't we in much better shape in our schools now that those Ten Commandments are gone? Listen to what Moses said to this young generation. Everyone 20 years of age and older has died now. Uh, they came out of Egypt. Everybody that's left were 19 years of age and younger when they came out of Egypt. So they're that young generation, that next generation. Moses says this in uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 47, for it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you're about to cross to the Jordan to possess it. He says, let me tell you something. The law that God gave you, it will give you life. Now, let me move back uh, in Deuteronomy. Let me go back to Deuteronomy and take you back to chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. And I want you to listen because he tells this young generation the same thing we ask about this. Well, isn't that passe? Why, why is this still around? Do we still listen to this or adhere it or follow it? Listen to what Moses says to that younger generation. Verse 20 Deuteronomy chapter 6, when your sons, your daughters ask you in time to come saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? God gave you this command. What does all this stuff mean? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and the Lord brought us up from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, what do you call that? Grace. 
grace. You can go back to chapter 18 and you can see where Jethro was of Exodus and Jethro, and listen, I'm not through in Deuteronomy, so just hang on. I, I just want to share this with you. You can go back to the 18th chapter of Exodus where Jethro was saved. It's all about grace. You come to the 19th chapter where you see the two um, aspects of God's nature there. You see the tenderness, his love, and the holiness. I showed you in both. There's nothing but the grace of God in both of those. Now Moses comes here, and God's told Moses, you tell these young people, tell your children about God's grace. Tell them about God's grace, but then don't forget God's law. Because he comes and he says, Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household, and he brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give. My Lord, there's a sermon right there. You see that? Do you see that right there? Verse 23, he brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give. Woo! He brought us out from there. Sin, slavery, bondage, in order to bring us in to give. He had to get us out of that to get us in over here. And so he brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all of these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is to this day. It will be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe all the commandment before the Lord our God just as he commanded. Do you see what he's telling them? He's saying this is how you teach your children. You teach them grace. You show them my grace. And in showing them my grace, then you show them how the word, my word, my commandment will guard their lives the rest of the time they live. How it will be a blessing to them. How it will be guardrails to them. Do y'all see that? Well, all right, let's go back over here to Exodus chapter 20 for just a moment. And I want you to think about that. That's the way God gives it. God, and, and I see this so clearly this time that I'm going through Exodus is that there's grace before he gives law. You've got an example of grace in Jethro. Then you come and you see the grace of God in God, in his love and in his holiness. And now you come to the encounter of the Word of God, and as God sets up His Ten Commandments, He is showing you grace ahead of time. It is grace before law. Now, what if God did that backwards? What if God had gone down into Egypt and said to the Hebrews, okay, here are my commandments. I'm going to give you my commandments. Here are my commandments, and I'm going to watch you and if you keep these commandments, then I'll come back and I'll redeem you. At some point in the future, I'll come back and I will save you. I'll deliver you. I'll bring you out of the house of bondage. Here, here my, here's my word. Here's my command. Well, same thing with us. What if God came and he gave you his word first? He said, okay, here are the Ten Commandments. Here are my commandments. This is what you obey. You do this flawlessly. You keep these perfectly. Keep my word. And I'll come back at some point. When I decide to come back and I'll save you at that point, you keep that. You know what? You know where we'd end up? In a devil's hell. You know why? Because you can't keep it. I can't either. None of us can. Do you see? Do you, somebody smile. Do y'all see the grace of God here? Is that not an amazing thing to you? That he says, I'm going to get you saved first. And then I'll bring you out here, and I'm going to tell you how to live life. And I'm going to give you this way, and it's going to be the best way for your life. Well, that's what God's going to do. That's what God does. He says, this is the way you live life. So in his word, you see his grace. Now, let me give you the third thing. And the third thing is this. His word reveals his way for you, his way of life. How does God want me to live? Now, verse 3, 
you come to the Ten Commandments. He's given us all of this grace, and he says now in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, that's the first of the commandments right there. That's the first of what the Hebrews call the ten words. If you ask the Hebrews, they'll say, well, they're, they're commandments, yes, but they are actually their words. Each one of these happens to be a word in Hebrew. And then you have some additional words that are added to it, but they look at it, they look at it that way. So he begins to give them these words, these commandments, You shall have no other gods before me. Now, God is speaking to the people. And the people listen to it through verse 17. Just look down the page. They listen to it down through verse 17. But in verse 18, all the people perceived that the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we'll die. What they said is essentially this, Moses, you've been going up to the mountain to get the word and bringing it back down. Go do that again because we can't stand this. We're going to die if we've got to listen to any more of this. Y'all feel that way on Sunday morning sometimes, don't you? We're, we're just, we're going to die. We can't, we, can't, we can't handle this. So you go up. Now, the New Testament tells us that Moses trembled too. Now, you don't read it here, but in the New Testament, we get a word about Moses at this point that says and states that he trembled, that he was afraid as well. And he, at this point, really was not wanting to go back up on the mountain again. Well, they've listened to all they can listen to here because there is this fear. But God now has spoken to them. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, I'm just going to deal briefly with that one commandment right here because all the Old Testament theologians say, all of those that are conservative, in other words, they all say you can take all the rest of the commandments and you can put them into that one that all the others flow out of that, that all the others come out of this. It's what Jesus said. You remember when they came in Matthew, I think it's Matthew chapter 22, and they said to Jesus, uh, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus said, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the greatest of the commandment, and the second is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's the whole of the commandments right there. I told you that at the beginning of this message. It's my relationship with God, my relationship with others. And so here, God boils really all of this down. If I am off in my life, I'm off right there. I'm just telling you. You say, what do you mean? Well, I mean that if I am out of fellowship with God and I'm off into stuff I don't need to be into and the struggles with sin and the flesh in my life is because of this, you shall have no other gods before me. I've gotten something out of whack with God's position in my life. You say, when a preacher, wait a minute now, because we... We're, we're not a bunch of pagans in here. We don't worship all of these, you know, idols that uneducated, you know, uncultured people in the backwoods of Borneo worship. We, we're not that. We don't do that. Is that right? Well, let me, let me take you to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was in Babylon. God put him in Babylon, and he put him there to preach the word. He was there. Same time, Daniel was there. He's in Babylon. Ezekiel's in Babylon. And so the Lord comes in chapter 14 of Ezekiel. Just just listen to this. Then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me. They came to the preacher. They came to the prophet. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. And have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? He asked Ezekiel that. He says, listen. The Babylonian 
culture was far advanced than the Hebrew culture. They were far more powerful, far more advanced culturally. They were, they were beyond where the Hebrews were in a lot of areas. They all worshipped these pagans, gods. Moloch was one of them. Uh, the moon god. All of these gods, they worshipped these gods and now Israel has come in there, and they're looking at a culture and a society that was far advanced than their culture and society, and they're thinking, well, maybe these people have got something here. And so they begin in their heart to worship these idols. Verse 4, therefore speak to them. Now God comes back. Ezekiel doesn't answer, but the Lord comes back in verse 4, and he says, speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through all of their idols. And you say, good night in the morning. What in the world is all of that being said? Well, it's very simple what's being said there, and it's this. God says to Ezekiel, these people play church. They come to church. They're in church. They go through, they come to the synagogue. That's where the synagogue got started, by the way, was in Babylon. Uh, they come to the synagogue. They worship. They quote scripture. They sing the hymns. They do all the stuff. They sit through the preaching uh, of the Torah, all of that. They listen to it, but uh, they walk out and they go out, and in their heart, they're not worshiping me. There's something else they've got in their heart that nobody sees. And he says, and then they come to you, and they say, hey, we'd like to know what the Lord says. And the Lord says this, I know what's in your heart. I know what you're doing in your heart. I know that all this stuff you're doing on the outside is just play church. And I know what's in your heart. And he says, you come to me for a word. He says, I'm going to be the one that gives you the word. And the word is this, I'm going to expose what's in your heart, and everybody will see. Wow. And we like to think we're too sophisticated. We don't worship things like, listen, let me tell you, we've got more gods today than the Babylonians ever had time for. We worship at the altar of more stuff than they ever did in the tents of Babylon. And God knows exactly what is in our heart. He knows exactly what we're doing. And he comes back here and he says to us, if you want to know what is out of line in your life, he says, what is out of line is this, you've got another God before me. That's the one commandment right there. If you keep that thing straight right there, you're going to be okay. But let me tell you, heaven help us when that gets out of whack in life. Y'all remember Bernie Madoff? You see, we think that we can just change our heart. You can't change your heart. It's impossible for you to change. Bernie Madoff was this financial fraudster that was worth $65 billion of everybody else's money because that's what he stole. He ran the largest Ponzi scheme in all the world, in all of history to that, to that time. Uh, $65 billion, and he spent it on the most lavish lifestyle you could possibly imagine. They auctioned off all of his stuff trying to get enough money back to give everybody just a little, even, um, who's that uh, actor, Kevin Bacon. I remember Kevin Bacon saying he'd lost everything. He'd invested everything with Bernie Madoff, and he said he lost every dime that he had, something like in excess of $20 million dollars. Lost it all. Couldn't get a bit of it back. They took Bernie Madoff, they put him on trial, and they put him in prison for 150 years. He would have to serve terms, not consecutively, but a term at the time, so that he never had possibility of getting out of prison unless he lived 150 more years. You know what he's doing in prison? I read a fascinating article on Bernie Madoff. He died just two years ago. What he was doing in prison was this. He had cornered the hot chocolate market in prison. 
he had worked out a deal with the commissary that every packet of hot chocolate that came into them was to come to him. He bought them all at one price, raised the price, and went out on the yard and sold hot chocolate packets at a higher price. You know why? Do you, let me ask you this. Do you think sitting in a courtroom, Bernie Madoff ever said, Lord, if you get me out of this, if I don't have to serve all this time, Lord, I just, or calling on somebody, call, call on Buddha, call on, call on whoever, you just get me out of this. You think he ever, I guarantee you facing 150 years in prison, I'd be out there trying to call on somebody. And yet when he gets in prison, what does he do? He goes right back to what his heart does. All his life, he ran schemes. You'd think 150 years of prison would change somebody. But the only person who can change somebody is Jesus Christ. And what God is saying back here in his word when he comes and he says this, listen, you are, as he gives his word, he gives this grace first, and then he says, I come to give you my word because if you will be obedient to this, you will live a life that is full and fulfilling. But not any other way, but my way. That's exactly, now I'm going to flip over to the New Testament. I'm almost done. I'm going to flip over to the New Testament. I want you to listen because Paul comes and he says, this is what we're to do. He comes and he says, in reference, I'm in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, in reference to your former manner of life, the way you live life before Jesus Christ, lay aside the old self. That's a, it's a word there in the Greek that means take your clothes off. Take the old self off like it was a garment. Take that garment of the old self off, lay it aside. It's corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, uh, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. Now that's, I pick up a new garment and I put a new garment on, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and hope. So I, I take off this garment of flesh. This is how I live this out as a Christian. And I lay that, all of the sin, all of the deceit, all of that, I take it off and I put it to the side and I put on, when I come to Jesus Christ, I put on the righteousness of Christ. So that, and you say, well, it's so hard. Listen, you come to the place when you long to follow Christ by worshiping him that you desire not to do the things of the flesh. Now, I got up early, early, early yesterday morning because I wanted to see what I've never seen before. Now, I've seen clips of Queen Elizabeth being coronated. I've never seen a king coronated before. And I wanted to watch it. And I'm sure some of you did as well. Do you, do you see the very first thing that was done? And that's, that, that's a religious service. That's not a state or secular service. It is a religious service. Do you see the first thing that he did? He knelt before the word of God and he kissed it. Uh, the heart of the ceremony is not putting the crown on him. The heart of the ceremony is what goes on behind those curtains there. That nobody can see that is kept out of the sight of anybody else except uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury who takes the oil and he anoints the head and the chest and the hands uh, of the new monarch. Um, the interesting thing is what he wore. So many different robes, but when he shows up and then when he leaves, he's got on this robe that has all of this fur, it's ermine. You ever heard of an ermine? Like a weasel. In the summertime, that ermine is browned. And then as winter comes on, he comes back out of his hole and he has this absolutely perfectly white fur. That's when they trap him. I mean, it's kind of interesting that He's kind of gone from one dirty garment to now an absolutely white garment. And that's when they catch them. Do you know how they catch them? They go out and they find their nest. And the trapper will put mud all around the nest of that ermine. 
and then they'll chase him until he's exhausted and he heads back to his hole. And if he gets to the hole and he sees that mud all around the hole, he refuses to go in. He chooses to, to be caught, to die. He would rather die than stain that white coat of his in any way. And the closer we get to Jesus Christ, as we put on his righteousness, as we are living in obedience to his word, because that's his heart, we will come to the place we would rather die than stain the robe of Christ that we wear. Let's stand. I just call you to respond to Jesus today. That if you're here this morning and you've never trusted him as Lord and Savior, to come to the one who died for you. The one who longs to clothe you in his righteousness. To take away the stain, the garment of sin, the garment of guilt, the garment of misery. And to set you free. You know, one of the things that Satan wants to convince us of is that if you come to Christ, you're going to go into slavery to him. The fact of the matter is you're in slavery to Satan and Christ is the one who sets you free because if you are set free by Christ, then you are free indeed. He sets you free to live life in such a way that he knows it is best for you. How many of you have been trying to live life your own way? Come to Jesus. Come to Christ. Come to the one who loves you. Father, in these moments, speak to our hearts. Draw us closer to you. And especially, Lord, those who've never put their faith and trust in you. I pray that you would draw them. Bring them to yourself for your glory. For the sake of your kingdom. For I pray it in Jesus' name. You come as Kirkwood.